And so, Lord, we come to you today with open hearts, with open ears, with expectation, and with an acknowledgement. We desire to be people of patience. We desire to be people of faith. Sometimes we see it happening in us all the time. We know you're working on that in us. And so at this time, we ask that you would help us to hear from you, learn from you, and apply what you have to teach us today. Amen. <laughs> and God gave them patience. Yes, you are a person of patience because God will grant the requests of your heart. And if you are praying as we just prayed right now for God to give you patience, he will do it. But how might he do it? Well, when we look at people of patience like Joseph, like Job, like Esther, we see that he might do it through problems. Now, in the case of Job that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, the problems were undeserved. We all recognize that many times we are the author of our own problems. And the Bible has plenty to say about that. But Job especially helps us to see that God acknowledges that there are times in our lives or in the lives of people when problems come that are not your fault. And yet, God still can use those problems and speak to us through the whirlwind. In the case of Esther, the problem was enemies. She was living in a foreign kingdom at a time when the people of God were not uh, authorized to lead themselves. In fact, their disobedience had brought about that kind of an arrangement. But Esther was an obedient follower of Jesus and had an opportune moment, a time for such a time as this, that God had called her and enabled her to be an influence. It involved risk to her. And so it entailed faith and trust, which are absolutely essential components of patience. You could even say synonyms of patience. So Job reminds us that problems, even if they are undeserved, can still be opportunities, that we can count it all joy because God can speak to us through our problems and God can bless us in the presence of our enemies. David, the king, knew about that, and he wrote Psalm 23 with that in mind, and that expression affirmed. Esther also reveals it, that even in the presence of enemies, the deliverance of God was greater and stronger than the powerful uh, people that had opposed her. Now, in Joseph, we get sort of a combination of these things, because Joseph deals with undeserved problems, Joseph not only has unrelenting enemies, but his enemies are in his own home and in his own work. And though he behaves well and follows God, he's mistreated by his masters. He's betrayed by his brothers. And one must wonder if Joseph himself wondered if he had been forsaken and forgotten by God. Joseph had an idea. Listen now, because this just might relate to you. He had an idea of what his life would be. And the idea of his life at an early age, which was full of grandeur, faith in God and his belief that God had a purpose for him, that God desired to promote him. I don't think that Joseph was ever arrogant, but he was once young, naive, and maybe just a little too cocky. But nevertheless, his expectation about what God would do in him came from God that was in his heart, that was in his mind. And that was the truth. But along the way, he saw all of that dying on the vine, if you will. He saw all of that going up in smoke. In other words, the dream he dreamed about the life that he would live turned out not to be his life at all, at least for a while, for a long while, for a long, long time, for years and years, so long that any reasonable person would rationally come to the conclusion or at least the very grave concern that God has forgotten me or God has forsaken me or maybe there's no God at all or maybe I simply never heard correctly from him. In the uh, famous uh, musical version of Victor Hugo's um, beloved 19th century novel, Les Miserables, The Miserable Ones, the miserable people, as it were, in French. There's a character who sings a song that says, I dreamed a dream. 
and it is about a grand and love-filled life. She had a, a, a relationship early in her life with a man that she thought would love her all her life, and instead he used her and threw her aside. She became pregnant, unwed, at a time when the social conventions made that virtually criminal, and it left her in a place of deprivation and despair, and her life eventually dwindled down into a kind of dungeon of depression and lost opportunities. Now, that may be a worse scenario than some of us can relate to, or maybe not. Maybe that hits closer to home for you than you wish it did. But I think many of us can relate to the idea that God has spoken something to us or we had a sense of purpose, maybe especially early in life, that somewhere along the way we seemed to lose our way or it failed to blossom. It failed to come to pass. I don't think he was the first person who said it, but uh, the former Beatle and uh, singer-songwriter John Lennon uh, has a line in one of his songs that says, life is what happens while we're busy making other plans. We make our plans, but life happens. And for Joseph, for us, life can be unexpected. But in this story of patient faith, what we see is that God has not forgotten Joseph. In fact, all along the way, even in the midst of undeserved problems, as with Job, and even in the presence of enemies, as with Esther, so with Joseph, God is at work, and so with you and I. This is what we want to lay hold of today, friends, that the assurance that Paul writes to us from Romans 8 is always true, that God will work all things together for the good of those who love him. In other words, for the good of those who patiently trust in him. And if sometimes, sometimes our patience fails, and if sometimes our trust fails, take heart. God is merciful. God's patience does not fail, and neither does his word. God never fails. The patience of Joseph in the prison of Egypt begins in the presence of his family. But it turns out that for Joseph, and I won't ask for a show of hands on who can relate to this, being in the presence of family meant being in the presence of enemies. We laugh about that, maybe because if we didn't laugh, we'd have to cry. But it's sad how many people can relate to betrayal from within the home. When we come to the story of Joseph, we come to a series of questions that I think many of us will find relatable. We want to be patient, and we're asking for it, Lord, but how can I be patient when the family closest to me is who hurt and betrayed me the most? How can I be patient when the good work that I do in school, in the workplace, in the church seems to go ignored, or I'm even punished for it? I take the brunt of some punishment by my superiors when all I've done is what I'm supposed to do. How can I be patient when God doesn't care how wrong my life has gone? When he seems to have forgotten me or maybe even set himself against me? These are the kinds of questions that Joseph's story calls to our mind. We're going to begin in chapter 37 where Joseph is betrayed by his brothers, and then jump to chapter 39, where in Egypt, in slavery, Joseph prospers and yet is punished. And finally, to his time in prison and his elevation in the palace, where we see that he was not forsaken by God and God had a plan. But let's start where Joseph starts, in the household of Jacob, Jacob and sons, a man also called Israel. He had a large family, including these 12 sons who would become the 12 tribes. But in these days, they were just young men, born to his multiple wives. You'll remember that Jacob was married to sisters, Rachel and Leah. There's an issue in the family right to start, right? Complicated situation. You can very well call this a blended family because in their competition to have the favor of their husband, remember that Jacob had wanted to marry Rachel all along, 
She was the one that he really wanted from his uncle, Laban. But Laban tricked him into marrying the older daughter, Leah, first. So he was married to Leah, but Leah always felt unloved. He loved Rachel, but Rachel couldn't conceive. She failed to have children, which was such an essential part of her identity in the culture at that time and from her own perspective, whereas Leah had continual children. Now, both Leah and Rachel had maidens, handmaids, that uh, assisted them, ladies' maids, if you will. If you're a Downton Abbey fan, you'll know a little bit about that, right? And these maids were also available as concubines to, uh, uh, to uh, Jacob. And so Rachel said, I'll use my maid to have a child. And so then her maid bore some of the sons. And then Leah said, well, two can play at that game. And her maid bore some of the sons. And then finally, Rachel had a child of her own. And that, that was Joseph. So you can see why Joseph had a favored position in his father's eye because this was finally the firstborn child of his beloved wife. Now, you can also see that there were problems of favoritism and unequal treatment in the family that are going to pave the way for greater troubles down the road. Joseph's brothers resented the favoritism with which their father treated Joseph. And Joseph made it worse because he seemed to be kind of insensitive to their feelings. And he was such a straight and narrow kind of guy that when his brothers, who were a bit of rabble-rousers and did a lot to get in trouble, you can read more about it in the book of Genesis, when they were doing things like that, guess who would tell on them? Joseph would come and tell Jacob, hey, here's what the older boys are doing. And they didn't like that. But Jacob did. He liked it so much that he showed his unbridled favoritism to Joseph, particularly through an elaborate, expensive gift. Many of us have heard about Joseph and the coat of many colors. His multicolored coat is not just a Sunday school fable. It's an evidence of the degree of investment that his father made in demonstrating how he saw Joseph as a prince among his sons. In those days, colored material was extremely uh, expensive to procure and to make. The dyes were very difficult to get. And therefore, colored clothing, especially vibrantly colored clothing, even of a single shade, was rather elaborate. To have a coat with many different colors was virtually a sign of royalty. Now, Jacob was a wealthy man, and so he put his wealth into this gift because he put his trust into this son, Joseph. But the brothers seethed over the fact that Joseph had this royal garment. Meanwhile, God is speaking to Joseph, and he speaks to him in dreams. Now, I can almost guarantee that one of the things that will happen after this sermon, because it happens almost any time that I preach on dreams in the Bible, is that people will come to me and they'll ask things like, do dreams have meaning? Or, Pastor, I had a dream, and can you tell me what it means? Listen, the Bible is very clear. Dreams can have meaning. And to suppose that that is something relegated to only the Bible is an unbiblical thought. The Bible never anywhere says that meaningful dreams only happen in the Bible. So it everywhere implies when it describes such an event that such things can continue. But it doesn't mean that every dream is meaningful. Nor does it mean that you and I always understand what the dreams mean. In fact, typically when people have dreams in the Bible, the reason we're reading about them is because they don't understand. Or if they do, we are told that their understanding comes from God. And ah, there's the key. If you have a dream, and it seems to you, as a, a person knowledgeable of the word, as a prayerful person, faithfully following Jesus, you have a sense that your dream means something, my suggestion would be, seek the Lord about it. But be careful about over-interpreting dreams. And recognize that sometimes it might just be that that day-old lasagna didn't settle right. <laughs> But these dreams that Joseph had, vivid dreams in the night, he is aware they have a spiritual significance. And he has an early gift from God to interpret the dreams. In one of them, he and his brothers are out in the fields as they would be doing because their father was a rancher. So they were sheep herders and farmers. And in this uh, agricultural work, they would gather together sheaves of wheat and sheaves of grain. He has a dream in which they are doing this and his sheaf of wheat rises up while all the other 11 sheaves of wheat bow down to it. He tells his brothers about this. Maybe not the best of idea. 
because the book of Genesis 37, 8 tells us they hated him even more for hearing about this dream. He has another dream in which the sun, moon, and 11 stars are in a kind of an orbit, apparently, around his star. They are bowing down. Whereas one dream was agricultural, another is celestial. It is though even on heaven, or in heaven and on earth, there is this uh, superiority of Joseph. He shares the dream not only with his brothers, but with his entire family. And Jacob is a bit put out by this. It may be one thing for the brothers to bow down, but do you really think that your mother and I are going to bow down to you too? He says to Joseph. But we are also told that he keeps it in mind. Remember, Jacob is a man who has himself encountered the Lord in dreams, in sleep. Remember when he was on his way to find a wife with his uncle's household, he had a dream in which he saw the, the ladder, Jacob's ladder, and angels rising and descending on it. He awoke and said, God was in this place and I didn't know it. Maybe there is something of that thought in his mind. He hears Joseph's dreams. He doesn't quite like it, but he keeps it in his heart and his mind thinking maybe God is in this. Both of these dreams are reiterating the same reality and it will, in fact, come to pass. But it's going to be many years later, decades later. In fact, the very nature of the dreams portends how this reversal will occur because ultimately it is Joseph's ability to interpret a dream about grain and a dream about a famine that elevates him to a position of authority over the greatest empire of the land at that time, Egypt. And it is because of that famine that his brothers will come to Egypt and will seek from him grain and they will bow down before him in doing so. It is Joseph's leadership that will save them but there is also, especially perhaps in this celestial cosmic dream of the sun, moon, and stars, a sense of the divine purpose at work in Joseph. It, it shows us that just like Abraham and just like Jacob, his father and his great-grandfather before him, Joseph receives divine messages from God in his dreams, and it is through God's divinely granted gift of dream interpretation that Joseph will be promoted in a foreign court the way that Esther was promoted in a foreign court, precisely the way that Daniel uh, recommends himself in a foreign court later on. And so we see in these dreams not only relationship to other major figures in the Old Testament, but in their nature and content, they are part of what demonstrates that Joseph is a type of Jesus. Consider that Jesus also is a man born of brothers. That is to say, born with brothers and sisters. The book of John says in its first chapter, he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Jesus was betrayed by a brother. Now Judas, although Jesus had a brother named Judas, Judas Iscariot was not his biological brother, but we are talking symbolically here. Jesus came to humanity as one of us, and we rejected him. And yet, in our rejecting of him, God elevated him. And as Christ was elevated on the cross, so it became salvation for us. We, human beings, meant it for evil, but God turned the cross to good. Joseph's story points us to Jesus' story. Now back to Joseph's story. The brothers are appalled by his dream and by his belief that he would be elevated over him, that they would ever bow down to him. And even Jacob resents it, as I said. And even in this, we can see some of the similarity of the messianic model in, G in Joseph's life. The rejection of the father is similar, in a sense, to the rejection of the religious authorities in the days of Jesus. Joseph himself is going to have to wait patiently because though he has seen these symbols, their fulfillment is far down the road, probably much farther than he imagines, and certainly down a road that he wouldn't imagine and wouldn't want to. But maybe it's most important for us to recognize how his own family don't yet realize who he is meant to be. And so there's a degree of similarity here, by the way, if you can hold this in your pocket uh, for another week with Jesus' disciples, who even though Jesus is right in front of them telling, him, telling them what God has shown him, they don't recognize it. We will see in next week's sermon 
and the patience of Jesus on the road to Emmaus, that can, Jesus can be right there with us, reading the scriptures to us, and we might not realize what is in front of us. Well, the brothers are like that, and they become fed up with Joseph's attitude and their father's favoritism. And so they take advantage of an opportune time when they are away with the flocks, far afield from home, and they overpower their brother. They rip his coat away from him, and they actually contemplate killing him. That's the degree of their jealousy and of their hatred. But cooler heads prevail, particularly Reuben, who is the firstborn, who was not known as a cool-headed guy, so this must be the intervention of the Lord. But Reuben probably recognizes that to kill their own brother, this kind of fratricide, is really an egregious sin. So he prevails upon his brothers to throw Joseph into a pit. They can figure out what to do with him later. And the scripture tells us that he has in mind that he'll come back and he'll collect Joseph. It will have taught him a lesson, but he will have protected him from any real harm. However, apparently at a time when Reuben maybe went to get a bite to eat or something, there are Ishmaelite traders that come along. And another of the older brothers, Judah, in fact, suggests, why don't we sell Joseph to these slave traders? That way we get rid of him without killing him. But what will we tell dad? So they go out and grab a goat from the flock. They slaughter the goat and smear blood on this coat. The coat of many colors, coated in the blood of a brother, ostensibly, but the blood of a sacrifice, in fact. You can see, once again, the foreshadowing of the story of Jesus. But what Jacob sees is the most horrible of his fears. His son is dead. Now, Rachel, Rachel had given birth to another child, a younger boy, Benjamin, but she died in giving birth. And so Joseph and Benjamin, the only two biological children of Rachel, Jacob's beloved wife, and one of these, Jacob believes, has also died. Maybe Jacob is feeling a little bit like Job. My favored wife died giving birth to a son. My favored son died at work in the fields. The brothers say he was devoured by a beast, but in truth... He was betrayed by them. Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, except among his own family. <laughs> he also said that faith in him could actually divide families. You know, it may be that God has a purpose in your life that your own family doesn't recognize. It may be that your very faith in Jesus has driven a wedge between you and your parents or your siblings or your children or even a spouse. And while that is not something that we know God desires, it is something that we recognize that God realizes and even warns us about. Don't be surprised if people in your own family don't recognize or support God's work in you. That doesn't mean that you don't care that they don't. It doesn't mean that it isn't difficult, but don't be surprised by it. Now, if they do recognize, then give thanks for that and tell them how thankful you are. But many will have to deal with, at least for some time, a period of resentment among people, close friends or family. Don't resent it back to them. Even if they actively oppose what God is trying to do, what should you do then? What do people of patience do? They pray. Remember when Pastor Hazel brought that message early in the year about the pattern of prayer? Make your requests known to God, give thanks to God, trust in God, and then leave it in God's hands. But Take a lesson also from Joseph's early life. Maybe things would have gone a little better for him if he had been a little more sensitive to the fact that the way he was talking about himself was alienating himself from his brothers. Have you ever seen a believer who is so enthralled with their spiritual sensitivity and insight that they turn off everyone around them? Well, God said to me, well, I know. I've had people complain about that to me, and you know, it's something you should hear, right? Sometimes people say, well, do you think you're the only one that God talks to? No, of course I don't think that. But if you think that, maybe I need to consider how I think about it. Maybe I need to consider how I talk about it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't acknowledge that God is guiding you, but be sensitive. Avoid a holier-than-thou attitude. Be careful also how you look at your friends, how you look at your family, your spouse, your children. Remember something. They're not just that. Your child is not just your child. They're also a child of God. 
God has a plan and a purpose for them that might surprise you. Don't be too proud to think that there might be a time when you would bow down to your child if what God is doing is elevating them to a place where their service to God can become salvation for you. I don't mean salvation in the literal sense. That comes from Christ alone. But what I mean is your child might be one who actually helps you in a day of need or your sibling or your spouse. But remember this. There's more to them than what you might see. Try to look at people through God's eyes. Be the kind of spouse, the kind of parent or child. Because kids, your parents are more than just what you see them to be. There's more to their life than you might know. So ask God to give you insight. And ask God to give you that attitude that encourages others to dream big, to expect great things. And be prepared to be surprised by how God might use people in your family and in your life in beautiful, creative, empowering ways full of unlimited potential. Decide to be an encourager and seek the Lord for what he has to say about how people can grow in him. Now, no matter how your friends and family treat you, no matter how they see you, you keep your eyes on Christ. Keep praying for God's will for them and for you and through you, but no matter what, no matter what betrayal you might experience, no matter what loss, keep on trusting God. And even if no one else sees what you believe God sees in you, recognize this, if it is of God, God will complete it. Now, it is important for me to say this. If you see yourself as super important and nobody else around you sees that, you ought to consider that the bulk of this scripture teaches us to be humble and tells us to think of others before we think of ourselves. If God is really elevating you, it is not for your own aggrandizement. It is so that you can be a servant of others. Jesus said, if you really want to be great in the kingdom, what do you have to be? Servant to everyone. But if in serving people, all they see you as is someone who is serving, but you believe that God has something more than that for you, don't look for that approval from others. Put your trust in God. He who has begun a good work in you will see it unto completion. Now, it may be that even as that work continues, you find yourself facing further obstacles. The story of Joseph is sort of like a heartbeat. He's got these ups and downs. God's giving him dreams of grandeur. His brothers put him in the pit. He gets sold into slavery, but in slavery, he gets elevated to a place of authority. There's going to be more of these heartbeat moments, these strokes up and down as we go along in the story. So these Ishmaelite traders take Joseph some 250 miles. He's probably on foot for that. Imagine that trip to the slave mart in Egypt, but he's not purchased by just anybody he is employed as a slave, employed, I use the term loosely. He's put to work in the household of Potiphar, who's actually captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Joseph, who is a man of intelligence, who is a man of exquisite dedication and excellence, and who is a man who is anointed by God, excels in the home of Potiphar. The scripture says the Lord was with Joseph so he became a successful man, even though he was a slave in the house of his master, because his master saw that the Lord was with him, and he put all that he owned in Joseph's charge, all the lands, all the household, all the other servants. Joseph becomes the manager of this great man's house, this military leader, really. There's somebody else in the household who's quite fond of Joseph, though, and that's Potiphar's wife. Uh-oh, trouble. She takes a special interest in Joseph. In fact, she is continually, daily plying him, trying to entice him into her bed. Finally, a day arrives where she literally reaches out and grabs him. This is the opportune moment. Come and sleep with me. My husband's gone. He won't know. Joseph is mortified. I can't do that to the man that I serve. He recognizes that it's a moral wrong. It's a legal wrong. And he, he flees. In fact, he flees so rapidly and wildly that she's left holding his cloak. Once again, Joseph's coat is going to be a sign and symbol of problem in his life. She has the coat in her hands and she shows it to her husband and says, 
this man tried to rape me. And here's the proof. And Potiphar is enraged. Whether he believes his wife or not, he's enraged that this entire event happened. And he throws Joseph into the shackles, into prison. Once again, the up has come to its down. Bad situations happen. There's a bumper sticker that says something like that. And we can find ourselves in situations like that through no fault of our own. Once again, shades of Job. Yet, even in this episode in Joseph's life, we see that when his brothers had betrayed him and he'd been sold into slavery, he didn't give himself over to despair. He didn't say, well, I guess I was wrong about everything that God said to me. He determined, I'm going to serve where I am to the best of my ability as if unto the Lord. I'm going to bloom where I'm planted, as the saying goes. So you and I also have situations that may be negative, and yet God calls us to be diligent in our duty, serving whoever we are serving in whatever situation as unto the Lord. And if we do so, the Lord says, I will reward your service. So you and I, let's seek to serve that way, even if no one appreciates it, even if someone lies about you, even if a manager says, you did this wrong and it was really them that did it wrong and they throw you under the bus, don't be retributive in that. Pray for them. Speak the truth. Be honest. Joseph never cops to it and says, oh yeah, that's true. He denies it. You can be honest, but also be faithful. Be the kind of worker whose labors witness to the goodness of God. Be the kind of boss or employer who honors your workers, who honors your team, who rewards faithful service. And whatever your role is, high or low, remember this, God is watching. God is always watching. Paul says to the Colossians, servants, obey your masters in everything. Do it not only in, in hopes of currying favor with them. Don't just do it for your salary or for a promotion. Do it with sincerity of heart. Do it with reverence for the Lord. Whatever you're doing, do it as unto the Lord and not for human masters because you're going to receive an inheritance. God will repay wickedness, but God will also honor faithfulness. Finally, we come to the last section of Joseph's story where trusting God is required when we feel forsaken, when we feel forgotten, when we feel hopeless or helpless. Once again, Joseph has gone from a relatively elevated position down into the pit, this time of the prison of Egypt. It is, however, not just any prison. Because Potiphar is captain of the king's guard, he's also keeper of the king's prisoners. This prison is for prisoners of the king. It's a royal prison. In fact, in this, it is, in fact, similar to the prison that Paul will be in that we will look at in a few weeks called the Praetorium, which simply means that it is the household of the governor or a military leader. This is the same kind of prison that Joseph is in. And here, the warden, the overseer, recognizes once again, this is a man who has the favor of God upon him. And so Joseph is elevated even in prison. He becomes a manager of other prisoners. And those prisoners are royal courtiers. In the case of the story that we see next, it's people very close to the king. There is a butler or cupbearer and a baker who are both imprisoned around the same time. Now, these might sound like household servants, but in fact, these are royal positions. The butler or cupbearer is essentially like a chancellor, a, a, a chief minister in the household. The cupbearer would bring to the pharaoh royal cups, sometimes divination cups. It, it could be ceremonial or even religious. But also, part of his job was to taste things that were brought to the king so that if anything was poisoned, the cupbearer would die. <laughs> now, it also means that the cupbearer was the one who would bring the cup to the king and say, it is safe. Can you imagine how important that role is? The baker is not just, you know, Chef Boyardee down there or something like that. It's not Keebler elves. The baker is in charge of the palace kitchens. Every food that comes before the king and all of the courtiers is coming through the auspices of this chef de cuisine. That is, again, a very intimate and powerful role. Now, the fact that both of these men had access to the king's meals means that they probably had ceremonial and political power as well as an influence on his physical health. And because they are both 
uh, imprisoned around the same time, it may be that the pharaoh at least felt that there was some kind of coup d'etat going on, that maybe these two were conspiring together or with others to try and assassinate him. Whatever the case, they are both put into prison having fallen out of favor. And they come under the stewardship of Joseph. Now, Joseph gets to know them there, and while they are there, they have occasion to have dreams. And both of these men have vivid dreams that so affect them that their whole countenance and demeanor is changed by it. And Joseph inquires, what's, what's the matter? Isn't that, isn't that a, a lovely aspect of Joseph's character? Here is someone who could so easily be embittered, who could so easily be self-centered, who could so easily be uh, utterly disregarding of others. Who cares? We're rotting here in this prison. God's forgotten me. My brothers hated me. My master's wife lied about me. My master betrayed me. Who cares what your problem is? But instead, he's someone who comes and says, you look down today. What's, what's the matter? That tells you something about the nature of Joseph. And inasmuch as Joseph is a type of Jesus, it tells you something about the nature of the Lord. Now, these two men share with Joseph the dreams that they had, and God gives Joseph insight. He's quite honest. One of the men has a dream that unfortunately portends his doom. And Joseph has to tell the cupbearer, you're going to be executed in three days. But the baker has a dream that Joseph says has good news. You're going to be freed. Pharaoh's going to bring you back to your post. And in fact, both of these things happen. Now, of course, the butler can't do anything to help Joseph because he couldn't even help himself. But the baker could have helped Joseph, but instead he forgot Joseph. And there Joseph remained in prison. But eventually, Pharaoh has a pair of dreams. They trouble him deeply. He goes throughout his entire court to all his wise men and soothsayers, but none of them can interpret these dreams. And the king is left very troubled. In one set of dreams, he sees these fat, sleek cows that are grazing, seven of them, and then they're devoured by seven weak, skinny cows that come up out of the Nile. Then he has a dream in which he sees stalks of wheat, first seven healthy, robust, strong stalks that are devoured or consumed, overtaken by seven weak, sickly-looking stalks of barren grain without grain. Now, when the baker hears about these dreams, he says, I know a man that can interpret these. And he recommends Joseph to Pharaoh. And Joseph is brought before the king, The king shares his dreams, and Joseph interprets them. Pharaoh's gratitude is so great that he gives to Joseph a place over the kingdom second only to himself. Essentially, he makes Joseph prime minister over all of Egypt. He grants Joseph a home. He grants Joseph wealth. He grants Joseph political power to steward the grain in the seven good years until the time of seven years of famine comes. And he gives Joseph a wife, a wife who will bear Joseph two sons, two sons that will become themselves two half-tribes. The tribe of Joseph will be composed of Manasseh and Ephraim. And their names actually reveal that Joseph has been given such grace by God that it has caused him to forget his earlier sorrows and to have multiplied blessings. But the greatest blessing is still yet to come because during that time of famine, When the brothers are dying from hunger back in Canaan, their father says, go to Egypt. They say there's a man there who has grain that he could share. Go bow down before him and see if he will help us. Now, the story is longer than we have time to tell, but you probably are familiar with much of it anyway. And if you're not, you can read through chapters 45 to 50 of Genesis and find this story. And in it, what you will see is through an elaborate series of interactions Joseph encounters his brothers who do not recognize him, though he recognizes them. And he leads them to a place where they are finally prepared to acknowledge and repent for what they did and to receive the good news that Joseph says to them, you intended harm to me, but God meant it for good. You meant to hurt me, but God has used me and even the ways that you hurt me to enable me to save you, and not just you, but many lives. Ultimately, all the lives of the household of Israel are saved because God used Joseph and Joseph trusted.
God. That's the patience of Joseph. That no matter how wrong things went, and no matter how hurt he was, even by those closest to him, no matter how great the temptation to think that God had forgotten him, Joseph believed that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. It's true for you today, too. I don't know what dream may have soured in your life. I don't know what betrayals you may have suffered or wrongs that may have been done to you. I don't know where you may have set yourself up for a fall by thinking a little too highly of yourself. I don't know where you might have lost hope that God is still looking out for you. But I do know this. God has never forgotten you. He is with you even right now. And he's asking, will you trust me? Will you entrust to me all the aspects of your life, all the hurts that you have felt, all the failures that you perceive? Will you put all of that into my hands? No matter what anyone may may have meant for evil, I will work it for good if you will give yourself to me. I want to pray that way right now with you. Will you join me? Lord God, it's easy for us to see the ways in which we are hurt. It's easy for us to forget how we may have hurt others. And all of us are familiar with that feeling of abandonment or having been forgotten. Right now, Lord, we ask that you would grant to us the faith to realize that you are near, the faith to trust that you are here, and the faith to entrust ourselves into your hands. Lord, we repent of our sins. We also pray forgiveness for those who have wronged us. And we ask that you would give us gentle forgiveness and lasting patience and trusting faith and that you would fulfill your plans and purposes for us and give us again that hope about the future and that ability to believe that dreams can come from you and that dreams can come true in you. But Lord, we ask for something better than just dreaming about our own promotion. We ask that you would give us the grace to realize that you would use us to bless others and make of us someone who makes the world a better place because of your work in us and your work through us. And so Lord Jesus Christ, We give ourselves to you today, once again, or maybe for the first time. And we say, I belong to you. Use me for your glory. I will trust in you. If that's your prayer, say with me, amen. Amen. And so it may be done to you. May it be. Go in the goodness of God and realize that God has greater things ahead for you and there are dreams he will fulfill for you and he has a plan and a purpose for you. Wait for it patiently and believe for it. Pray, read the word, and be blessed as the Lord blesses you in his mighty spirit. Amen.